Hi, I'm Jesse. You're watching JLS Comics. Thanks for pressing play and welcome to another episode in our History of Comic Book series. Today we're surfing the waves of time and exploring the history of the UP Seedco box, the corner box, and some of the stamps that you've seen on covers over the years. They all have rather storied histories and contain tons of useful information about the book that you might be holding in your hands right now. At any point during the story, if you're not already holding a book, feel free to pause the video and pull out a book from your collection so you can compare what we're talking about to the books in your own collection. So, Alright, without further ado, let's jump right in. Our story begins in the 1930s and with DC Comics. The issue number, the 10 cent price, and the date frequently travel around the cover depending on the issue. Action Comics in the 1930s had a circular corner image emblazoned with a 64 pages of thrills, but with 1939's Action Comics number 16, it instead started featuring an image of Superman. Marvel tried this on a couple of issues of Millie the Model in the 1940s, but these attempts sort of faltered all the way up until the 1960s. In the late 1950s and early 60s, there was only an IND on Marvel covers, which indicated that the books were distributed by International News Distributors, the owners of DC Comics, and if you want to know why, check out my How DC Saved Marvel video in the same series. Sometimes with a little banner in the top left cover, just like this, Journey into Mystery. In 1959, Thorpe and Porter Limited distributed DC Comics to the United Kingdom market. Batman 127 was one of the first, but this was a test phase with small numbers. So small that they had someone physically stamping the cover of each book with a nine pence stamp. Thorpe and Porter also distributed Atlas, which of course became Marvel, and after a few years they started printing the nine pence right on the cover instead of the ten cents for the US market. Hence, the pence price variant was born. A common misconception is that these are subsequent printings. They are not. They are still first printings. DC was really great with the branding, adding their roundel to covers, but Marvel, struggling with brand identity, didn't until 1961. A small box appeared on covers with letters M. C. But Stanley didn't tell anyone what those letters meant until 1963. Fantastic Four number 14 and Amazing Spider-Man number 2 were the first books to have the corner box. Steve Ditko claims he came up with the idea for the ASM book first, but Fantastic Four was scheduled for publishing first that month so it technically gets the credit. Suddenly all books from May 1963 forward had the box in the corner with Marvel Comics Group name on it and the cover price. These first corner boxes featured art by Steve Ditko and some by Jack Kirby. In 1965, without consulting Martin Goodman, Stanley added Marvel Pop Art Productions to the corner box and fit with the culture of art at the time. But people complained and just a few months later Lee changed it back to Marvel Comics Group and actually issued an apology in 1966's Marvel bullpen page letter to fans. We goofed again, he wrote in big bold letters. DC's answer to Marvel Pop Art was the go-go check strip that they placed across the top of their comic books. Didn't last long either. The images continued to rotate between full body characters and floating heads and served as a roll call for the team books as well. The price and date were always located below the character, except for a brief stint in 1968-69 when they were printed at the top of the box. Then with the Marvel explosion of the late 60s at full capacity and as still the perfect film and chemical became a reality, the IND that graced the covers for all those years was replaced by CCC, Curtis Circulation Company. Remember those Pence variants I mentioned? In 1971, Marvel introduced the Marvel Comics Group banner at the top of the books. This was the same for the Pens books, however, they lacked the Sir Curtis Circulation logo. However, in 1974, the UK banner changed to say Marvel All Color Comic. On June 26, 1974, UPCs, the Universal Product Code, was officially introduced and became a way for stores to track inventory much more accurately. In 1976, two years later, comics publishers began adding UPCs to the covers. These worked for newsstand editions, but most comic shops didn't have good enough point-of-sale systems, although a few distributors provided scannable inventory sheets if the shop was an early adopter. It wouldn't be until the early 90s when most books had them, as 90% of the market went to comic book shops by then, but we're getting ahead. The next evolution for the comic book box took place in the mid-1970s. Marvel test marketed price increases from 25 to 30 cents in 1976 and from 30 to 35 cents in 1977 in a few cities before instituting them nationwide. And so a couple of issues of the Marvel books have price variants. The higher, rarer prices go for about 2.5 times the regular price. These variants, though, apply only to the price. The rest of the cover, including the UPC box, remains the same. Whitman, a division of Western Publishing, contracted with Marvel in the 1970s to market bag sets of Marvel comics in places like Kmart called Marvel Multimags. Those came through to a bag and can be distinguished by an altered upper left box. It had a white diamond on a black background instead of a square, and no UPC code. These issues with diamonds are the same printings as their counterparts. 
Diamonds. The fat diamond, it's called, indicated the Whitman Channel books, while the smaller diamond indicated direct market diamond. The Marvel issues with a diamond and a blank UPC box were sold in Whitman three packs. So these were printed by Western Publishing and marketed through their Whitman Comics division. This was beneficial to Marvel because it allowed their comic books to be in stores where Whitman had exclusivity. What this amounted to essentially was a proto direct market system. And for more on this, see one of my earlier videos on the history of the direct sales market. However, it was National Periodicals, owners of DC Comics, that came up with the idea of multi-packs. It was in the 1960s that they trademarked the word comic pack. This is the concept that Marvel used for its multi-mags. It allowed them to bundle and resell all the copies returned to them through the newsstand process. In 1967, Whitman Comics took over the distribution of DC's line to supermarkets, and they took off and ran with this idea. Instead of the black diamond that Marvel used to differentiate these, DC used the Whitman W logo and a slash mark through the UPC code. Up until this point, all variations were first print. It wasn't until Star Wars number one in 1977 when Marvel began printing reprints and second printings, and these were clearly indicated on the corner box. However, there are variations for Star Wars number one, and if you want to watch another video, watch my How Marvel Save DC video to learn how Star Wars helped to save Marvel comics at the time. Only the first few issues of Star Wars had reprints. Starting in 1979, aligning with these new direct market program, Marvel began sending diamond logoed issues directly to comic shops. They'd have the white diamond on a black corner box and a UPC with a strike through, then later a diamond corner box with a spidey head instead of a UPC code. The diamond, along with the UPC later on, and the exact price, allowed Marvel to track which channel the books went through and at what price. From the Marvel Comics Guide to Collecting Comics, page 6, it says, The number, month, and price in this diamond shape means the issue was not distributed by Curtis Circulation and that you probably got it from a direct sales comic shop or other outlet. The two boxes with a little CC symbol meant that it was circulated by Curtis. The diamond was Marvel Direct, however, these same editions might have been packaged and sold by Whitman, just not on newsstands. As you can imagine, this led to some confusion among the reader base, and it led to press releases and bullpen bulletins for Marvel to clear up the confusion on the CC versus the diamond logo books. In 1982, partly due to shipping and production costs, as well as the increasing exchange rate disparity, publishers like Marvel started to make comic books exclusively for the Canadian newsstand market. Direct edition books had the US, UK, and Canadian prices in the corner box. Marvel made these up until 1986 when the two newsstand runs were merged, DC Comics in 1988. This is right around the time when the direct sales newsstand split was in the 50-50 range. Marvel made the Canadian newsstand price 1.25 times the US price, so a 60 cent copy in the US would have a 75 cent price for the Canadian newsstand market. This set designation for Canada was a small fraction of the print run, and therefore are considered incredibly rare, especially in a high grade. Also in 1982, the corner box shape itself was changed to an M shape. When Todd McFarlane came on board, he suggested changing Spider-Man's pose in the box from running to him hanging upside down with a web line, believing that one of the character's main appeals is his webbing. McFarlane's corner box art first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man number 308. Two. When Jim Shooter left Marvel, the UPC box design on the direct editions was up to each editor. Some used standard images, some let cover artists draw on the cover. In April of 1991, a Captain America head logo appeared with Uncanny X-Men 275 to celebrate his 50th anniversary. Then we got a whole slew of anniversary boxes. There was a Spidey 30th, Fantastic Four 30th, Avengers 30th, X-Men 30th. DC was using general ads like DC where the action is and more pages from the new DC, which featured a recently launched a DC Bullet logo, or said Wolfman Aparo, the creative team. In the late 1980s and into the 1990s, DC Comics made special reprints sold in multi-packs at stores like Walmart and Kmart. The DCU UPC variants were only distinguishable by the DC Universe lettering in the box where the UPC barcode is on other editions. Unlike the Diamond Box variants of Marvel, these were not first printings. By 1993, the newsstand market was down to nearly 10%, with 90% being direct market. This was coupled with the rapid rise in comic book shops that we talked about in the direct market history video. In July of 1993, with Amazing Spider-Man number 379, Marvel switched from the UPC box art to UPC codes that say direct edition on them. So now all covers had the UPC code by this point, and companies gave books a five-digit supplemental code instead of recycling the two-digit one they'd used prior. And this is what they've used up until today. For newsstand UPCs, it had the newsstand code in a narrow-lined 
month code. Keep in mind that the date is also sometimes printed in the box. There will typically be a, a two month disparity between the printed date and the code. This is the publication date and the actual shelf date. For the direct edition UPCs, they have a 59606 manufacturing code and another saying issue, cover, print run. The corner box is a staple of Marvel's covers lasted until 2001. They frequently made their way back, however, since then in the form of homage covers and Joe Juice with corner box variants, for example, as part of an update to the Rebirth campaign, DC updated their corner box in December of 2017. Up until that point, they also had a UPC code, the differentiator for direct sales. It did say direct sales. Newsstand had that area blank. When the Comics Code Authority stamp first appeared on covers, it was on the right side of the book, eventually making its way left and became part of the corner box. As the code became less influential, the stamp became less prominent. Marvel abandoned the code in 2001 after X-Force 116 was found not to be up to code for their own rating system called the Marvel Comics Rating System, which also made its way onto covers. X-Force 116 was the first book in decades, other than underground comics of course, to not carry the CCA stamp. In 2010, only DC, Archie, and Bongo were still adhering to the code, and by 2011, DC and Bongo stopped, with Archie becoming the last publisher to stop submitting to the Comics Code Authority. You can now find these rating systems as part of the code and lettering within the UPC box. And that, my friends, is the histories of UPC code boxes and the illustrious history of the rather nostalgic corner box. As always, feel free to leave additional information, questions, and comments down in the comments section. If you like comic superheroes and videos like this, hit that like button. And if it's your first time here, also be sure to hit the subscribe button and be part of the ever-growing JLS Comics family. Thanks for watching, and I will see you soon.